back to What One Thing, a smart meetings podcast that provides you with a shortcut to the top of the events world by asking successful people what made the difference in their careers and lives. I'm JT Long, Vice President and Content Director at Smart Meetings, and we have a treat for you today. Louise Bang is Regional Vice President of Sales and Distribution at Marriott International Caribbean and Latin America. She's a hospitality veteran and a world traveler. Her love of the industry has shaped her career and life, and she's agreed to share her insights about the power of sharing cultures with us today. Hi, Louise. Hi, JT. Such a joy to be joining you. Thank you for this great opportunity. Oh, thank you for the time to chat. We were just saying we see each other all the time at events and we're we're running so fast. We wanted to set aside some time and, and really talk and get to know you better. I love that. Thank you so much for making it happen. Much appreciated. Absolutely. So let's start. You've worked in 20 countries at some of the top hotels in the world. How did you get the travel bug? Oh, my goodness. So while I was born in Denmark, I was actually raised in Spain, in the south of Spain, in Costa del Sol. And as those of you who are familiar with that area will know, it is renowned for its tourism. So I grew up in a super international environment. My friends from school were from all over the world. And that sort of inspired me to ensure that I could choose a career career that would allow me to work anywhere in the world because I didn't really have any deep roots. I didn't know where I'd want to live, where I'd want to be. So I really wanted to make sure that the world could be my home. And as a result of that, in looking at different options, I looked at the legal career. I looked at being an architect. I considered interior design. But many of those are specific to your location, especially law. And then hotel management came up as an option. And I thought it was a phenomenal way of working in the service industry, which I had grown up with and was fascinated by. But also there are hotels all over the world. So I, I didn't have to choose a place to, to reside for the rest of my life. My idea really was to spend a couple of years in different countries and move around the world. So I studied hotel management. Then I joined Marriott in global sales. And I started traveling from Jordan to Thailand to Costa Rica in my very first year. And I have never looked back. I spend the whole year traveling somewhere and I thoroughly enjoy it. So you caught the bug early um, and you were intentional about hospitality. Was your family in hospitality? No, they weren't. My mom was a nurse, but she worked for an international insurance company. So she would pick up patients all over the world. So she would come back when I was very early, having traveled to Japan and to Thailand to pick up patients to bring back to Scandinavia. My dad was in the real estate business and he would come home with stories of having met with customers from all over the world who were looking to relocate or buy a holiday home. So somehow it was just innate from their experiences. And I think also just from school, when you are surrounded by my close friends were Swedish, Iranian, Chilean, Argentinian, and British, you you just, you have a flavor for the world and and it just bites your curiosity for sure. And where did you go to hospitality school and and how did that education help shape you? So I went to hospitality school in the UK at the University of Surrey. And the way that I landed on that choice is my father at the time said, well, you're going to have to call some of the best hotels in the world and ask the general manager where you should go study. So I was 17 at the time and it was not something you naturally did or just picking up the phone, but I did. And I called up um, three key hotels and all of the three said University of Surrey in England. So I went to, I flew in and I moved to uh, Guildford, which is about 40 minutes from London. And I did my hospitality career there. And I think that really formed me in... I guess like everybody else who was asking for recommendations, you were again surrounded by people from all different uh, parts of the world. So it just kept inspiring me to to work in hospitality and continue to, to fulfill that dream. And then just before leaving there, my parents actually went bankrupt. So within a week, I had to find a job. And I started working in a restaurant and bar, and then I continued there working every weekend in hotels. So I was in a strange way, a a difficult situation was fortunate. When I graduated, I already had four years of experience because I had been working during my university degree. So very a blessing in disguise in many ways. I certainly look back at that uh, time and with, with fond memories. 
Absolutely. Well, and all of that travel, I know that one of the things we've talked about is the, the power of travel to be a force for good in the world. How, how do you think that travel is able to really bring people together? So I think travel really unites people. There is something about learning a culture, learning about a destination, seeing how different people live, work, what motivates them and what drives them. What are the spectacular cultures, histories, gastronomies? That is what really unites people. But I think the first thing you learn when you travel is we all have a lot more in common than we have differences. So it, it be- makes you more tolerant. It makes you have to push yourself to be understood and to understand others. And you truly learn the marvels that this world has to offer. So I, for me, I think just the more you travel, the more tolerant and open-minded you become. And that certainly bodes you really, really well, whether it's personally or professionally. It's definitely, definitely for my my lifestyle, my career, my outlook on life, for sure. Well, and the other thing that you learned is... It looks like a zillion teen languages. Tell me, does speaking all those languages help you to have more empathy and really understand people? How many languages do you speak now? So I speak three languages fluent and I understand another three to four as a result of those. But in my family growing up, my father spoke seven languages and my mom four. So that's nothing special, my three (laughs) mother tongue languages. However, what is different is that I grew up speaking all three. So it is very different when you when you grow up and you're interchanging between languages versus learning them along the way, right? So in those three languages, if you start asking me for adverbs, adjectives, connotations, I generally won't be able to advise you, but I know what is right and what is what is the correct grammar. And then I studied English literature, so that helped a little bit as well. But I think the one thing that language really does, if we talk about travel uniting us, when you start speaking several languages, and it doesn't need to be many, it's just one more than your mother tongue, um, it opens your mind because it enables you to focus on understanding other people and being forces you to be understood by others. That automatically engages you in a much deeper communication with another person. When we speak in our own language, we generally assume that everybody understands us. And it just doesn't force you into an area where you need to make yourself understood and seek to understand others. So that's why I think languages really, really help you build that bridge. The other thing that I think is fascinating with languages is that at the end of the day, it's a function of the culture, the traditions and the history of a country. Country, right? And it evolves over time. So you are learning a language, but you have to continue evolving your knowledge of that language because it evolves as society evolves. And that allows you to learn how people live, what drives their motivation, what inspires them. I think that's what's really, really special. I had a situation earlier this year and I'm, so my mother tongue is Danish, although my English and Spanish is better for sure. But I was in Denmark and having to run my father's business for a little while. And my work Danish is not as strong as my social live or conversational Danish. And there were a few phrases that people were using that I just had no idea what they meant because we all use abbreviations or slangs or we take a line from a movie or something like that and it was incredibly interesting to just be back in the country and then having to sort of relearn the modern language terms and understood what people were telling me whether it was the finance people or the accountants or the customers right and and my sister and I certainly had a lot of laughs about the evolution of language and how we you know evidently from not living there anymore we weren't quite in tune with with that evolution but it's it's a function of society and it really lets you in as people you know our own name is music to our ears right and so it is as people speak your own language or at least make try to make themselves understood in the language of the person that you're speaking to it goes a long way I mean, that's human behavior we all just want to feel understood and connected and yeah doing that in their own language is is the best way to make them feel seen Absolutely. Even if it's a greeting or a thank you, right? I always say just learn to say hello, goodbye and thank you and and maybe one other thing that already people are going to truly appreciate. Absolutely. Well, and then the other thing, of course, that happened to all of us was that we weren't allowed to travel suddenly for a couple of years there. How did you manage that? And and how did that feel after traveling so much? So my other half, my boyfriend lives in London and he would call me up and he's like, you must be like a lion in a cage. And I think he was feeling blessed that he wasn't in the same room as me every minute of the day. And that's exactly right. I felt like a lion in a cage from having been traveling most of my time to suddenly being at home and not being able to move. I certainly struggled just with that 
concept, right, of, of not being on the road. But I very quickly adjusted and, and living in Florida, we had access to a lot of good weather and outdoors. So I quickly retook up a lot of my hobbies that I don't always have a chance to practice. So I was out kayaking, playing golf and, and just enjoying my day to day and my life and the things that, that I find joy in. So that was really a, another blessing, I would say, in disguise of being able to just nurture myself, nurture my hobbies and my interests in that time but as soon as they gave us green light to travel i was on the road and i didn't stop and i i think just before we joined this call i was telling you that my my latest record was 11 weeks of travel and that was borderline nearly too much <laughs> but i but i i do enjoy it. and mainly because i like connecting with people so you know face to face always wins in my world absolutely and i love how you always see the blessing in disguise and everything it sounds like all this talk about travel makes me want to get up and go. Let's take a minute to hear from our friends at Valley Forge and Montgomery County Tourism and Convention Board. In Valley Forge and Montgomery County, PA, there's room for meetings and room for more. Conveniently located in the heart of the Northeast Corridor, Montgomery County, PA is home to more than 300 venues and 80 hotels with ample space for meetings, conventions, and conferences of any size and budget. But when you're in Montgomery County, there's more to explore than just great meeting rooms. Visit must-see historical sites like Valley Forge National Historical Park. Check out the world-class shopping at the King of Prussia Mall. Enjoy the mouth-watering cuisine from countless restaurants and don't miss our award-winning craft breweries, wineries, and distilleries. Enjoy our vibrant art scene or get outdoors on 96 miles of trails. You can even take a swing at Top Golf. There's endless ways to fill the time in between sessions. Meetings shouldn't be all work, and we can make planning one less work too. Visit meet.valleyforge.org to get started. So you were released from your cage as we all were and people are back traveling like crazy. I was just in Italy. It is packed. People are so excited to be out. Talk to me from your perch and your travels. What are you seeing both in your area in the in the Caribbean and Latin America, but but largely what are you seeing about looking forward for travel? You know, I think when when travel started coming back, we all talked about the pent up demand for travel, right? And I think that is certainly still present. It is it is also easing in certain locations because people are going now further afield or they're looking for new ventures as well. But I think one of the things that we all learned as did I is we got a glimpse of what life without travel looked like and none of us want to have that in our lives again. So I think we've all prioritized travel and our customers have as well, right? Everybody, travel has become much more important than purchasing goods, assets in many ways. People are prioritizing those trips and we see that in the Caribbean and Latin America as well. I think, you know, I always joke my heart beats faster in this part of the world because it really has so much to offer. We we can see, you know, a lot, even on the group space, for example, which is the area that I that I focus a lot on for this region, is we see more and more customers looking at the options in the Caribbean and Latin America because they're focused on culture. They want experiences. They want to tick off those bucket lists. They want to get more immersed into destinations, more authenticity. And if you think about it, look, look just from a gastronomy point of view, for example, we have some of the most creative of f &B in the region, whether that's authentic flavors um, that you can create traditional dishes with or new dishes with. And, you know, I'm a big foodie. I love traveling the world and trying the food that also educates you on the location. But in, in, in the Caribbean and Latin America, I mean, hard to rival the Mexican and the Peruvian cuisine, right? If you look down your street, you likely have a Mexican restaurant and a Peruvian restaurant. And here we have more Michelin starred restaurants and many destinations around the world and a gastronomy that is just really hard to beat. The raw product is incredible. Often you talk about farm to table and organic food. In this part of the world, it most of the places that's all there is they don't know anything different so that's definitely helping to attract business into the region and then i think just the immersive experiences i think if you think about you know you're trying to achieve a bucket list or you're doing an incentive or a meeting with your customers and you really want them to leave with with a memory that that's going to stay with them right and and i think that the companies are using it also nearly as a retention strategy of making sure that they do something that's valuable to them we have that whether it's arriving in in solaz the luxury collection los cabos sticking your feet in the sand and having that welcome cocktail with that incredible view surrounded turning around and seeing one of the most architectural 
actually beautiful hotels in the world. That's something that you're gonna you're gonna remember, right? And and enjoying that Baja experience and the gastronomy that part of the world has to offer. It really it has a profound impact on on people. And then the other thing I think the pandemic did is we want both outdoor and indoor experiences. We want a little bit of both, right? And and we have that in most of our hotels. There's just so much visually appealing, and whether you're in the Caribbean and Costa Rica or in Mexico or going down south into Buenos Aires, it is pretty spectacular. And the culture is woven through all of that, through the food, through the experiences, through the the built environment around you. 100%, 100%. I, I love this part of the world for many, many reasons, but the biggest reason is just the people. When you walk into the hotel, service is led from the heart. They, they carry their, their heart on the sleeve, right? They, they thoroughly enjoy the world of hospitality. They enjoy welcoming people to, to their homes, which are the hotels in our cases. They really want people to enjoy their country as much as as they enjoy their own, right? They, they, they want to make it as special for them as it is for the customer. And that's something you've talked about before as well, is the whole idea of radical customer service. And as we've come back from COVID, some of our experiences at different hotels, as, as we all struggle with getting yeah. enough people back, have been um, all over the place. What does that mean for the idea of radical customer service? When I talk about this, I talk about three, three specific words come to mind. The first is empathy. I think as, as associates, as employees, and as us ourselves, you know, we have to put, learn to put ourselves in someone else's shoes. And with that, it's not enough just putting ourselves in their shoes and keeping our beliefs and our perceptions. We need to let go of those preconceived ideas and perceptions. And we really need to think like the customer as well. So, and that requires a very deep level of listening. And it requires a very, very deep level of just reaching out, you know, soul searching and really finding out what that customer is looking for. So driving that empathy is really important. The other part, I think is as much as you can connect to the customer and what their needs are, if you aren't empowered to actually deliver on that and those expectations, then you won't really be able to create that radical service. So I think the other part is really empowering your, your team members, empowering every single person to be able to deliver that service and go above and beyond, right? Understand what their needs are, but really not just what they're asking for, what they specifically are looking for and what's going to make a difference. I think as soon as our team members are able to create those memories and create a moment that's so remarkable for them, that's when you start creating a powerful service experience and they want to come back for more and more and more and they're going to be talking about your hotel and your event to anybody who'll listen to them, including those who won't, right? It, it just <laughs> it gets under people's skin. And that's what you're looking for. You're looking for brand advocates or raving fans, right? Who are just going to be your extension of your sales team. I always say we can get that guest service experience, right? Then, you know, the sales job is much, much easier. And then the fly final one I would say is engagement. So I always talk about three E's, empathy, empowerment, and engagement. And the engagement is more about just driving meaningful relationships. I think especially in sales which is the discipline that I lead it you know whether it's a 30 second encounter or a relationship that's built over many um, many many months it is driving that customer service engagement and often they become they repeat guests right we have so many stories of the kids of the families who've learned to swim at a certain hotel right or the third generations are visiting at the same hotels time and time again and they know all of our associates by name um, you know they're in invited to their weddings or at their social events or they choose our hotels because they want to, to make sure that the next generation has that same connection as they do. So I think that level of engagement really allows our teams to be present in the moment, to be truly focused on that guest and they then feel it. They, they become, they create that sense of family in a way which is so important. So those are really my three, empathy, empowerment and engagement. And when it's a meeting, you could be creating hundreds or thousands of raving fans at every event right so and, and I think I think that's where yeah we often talk about this in an individual environment it's exactly the same in meetings right you have and it's, sometimes it's easier because you have a group arrival you have a group dinner that you generally know where that group is at all times
time so you can plan, you can structure, and you can curate those interactions very, very carefully, right? So that you can create those those raving fans. Absolutely, 100% agree. Well, I could talk to you all day, Louise, but this show is called What One Thing? And I want to know what one thing in all of your travels and in all of your career made the difference and what can our community learn from that so they can apply that secret to their lives? Well, JT, you might be surprised to hear this, but when I was young, in my very early years, I was an extreme introvert child. I would not dare say hello to anybody, including my parents. Yes, <laughs> most people are when I tell this story. And um, my parents decided to start me horse riding. They were like, we have to find something where she feels comfortable, where she can own it, where she can build strength. And I started at five years old. I would fall off every day, go home crying, saying I never want to go back. And then in the morning, I would be begging them to drive me back. And this would repeat again and again and again. And by eight, I was competing. And by 12, I was teaching adults to horse ride. That was really a changing time. But the one message message I would give to people is I learned how to build my confidence and I learned how to manage anxiety or those nerves and to find out where I was comfortable in my in my own skin find find that level of comfort with who I was and and how I was and where I wanted to be once you have that you've got to let that form your personality and your character and then it's just marching forward and seek to accomplish everything you set forth for yourself so it's it's owning your space owning your personality and then just living it to the fullest so you learned how to be comfortable by first making yourself really uncomfortable yes i definitely did (laughs) yeah there's something in that Mm -hmm. You literally got back up on the horse. Every single day. It went on for a long time, too. (laughs) (laughs) Well, this has just been so delightful. I have learned so much about you. I thought I knew Louise. Look at me. I I have a whole new appreciation for all you've accomplished and, and all the great things that travel can do for groups, for individuals, and for the world. I agree. Thank you for sharing this time. And thanks for the opportunity, JT. It's been such a joy chatting with you. And I hope we get to see each other soon and have a little bit more time to catch up as well. But thank you to everybody. And let's continue traveling and driving inspiration for the groups and event segments uh, all around the world. It really brings so much joy to everybody's lives. Let's. Thank you so much. Have a fabulous day. Bye. Thank you. Smart Meetings, What One Thing was produced by Bright Business Media. Visit smartmeetings.com to subscribe to your daily dose of inspiration.